let's talk about spars warnings. Uh, spars, as some of you may know, is a semantic parser for C. So, originally written by Linus, and uh, now maintained by some other people, it is a pretty powerful tool, well adapted for uh, static analysis in the kernel. Um, sorry, am I standing on something? Uh, yeah. Oh, did you all not? Ah, right. So, yes, spars, semantic parser for C, powerful in that it's well adapted to kernel use, and a lot of its strength comes from type annotations, and the Linux kernel already has these type annotations. So, it's one of the better things that we have in the kernel for static analysis. And I'm here to talk about it and encourage you to use it and encourage you to fix the warnings that it produces. Um, it's not a perfect tool, as we'll, we'll have a look. Um, it runs as a separate pass to compilation, and it's actually really easy to use. Um, you run make and you add C equals two, and you get sparse warnings on all of your files. If you want to get sparse warnings just on the files that you've changed, make C equals one. Um, and then the warnings that it produces are somewhat akin to compiler warnings, and I sort of believe we should treat them as such. So we're going to look at um, these things today. So we've looked at spa what sparse is. We're going to look at the things that it detects. So it detects both some simple static analysis things, and it detects more when we give it type annotations. We're going to look at how we use it in the kernel, or sort of more accurately, don't use it. And we're going to look at how we can improve that situation, both in terms of long-term things we can do and you know, give us a tool to make sparse more useful in the short term. And we're going to look at where we can go from here. And because every year we roughly get some people who are interested in kernel development but don't know where to start, uh, I actually think fixing sparse warnings is a great way to start kernel development. So I'm going to give you some pointers as to how you might do that. Spars, let's talk about what it can detect. Spars does some simple static analysis. So static analysis, if you're not aware, is a technique to try and basically detect bugs before you run your code. And so something reads your code and looks at it and figures out things that are dodgy. So some things that might be dodgy are an expression using the size of a bull. Uh, that's not really especially well defined. Um, and things like getting a a cast where you're casting a bunch of Fs to a bool, which is just odd. Um, sparse will also tell you if you try and access outside the size of an object. And sparse, one of the more common sets of sparse warnings is if you have a symbol that is only declared in one file but isn't static, doesn't have a prototype. So it will ask you if you want things to be static. The real power of spars, though, comes with type annotations, because with type annotations, spars is able to figure out more things than the C compiler can figure out by itself. So we can tell spars about the endianness of variables. So is something coming out of your hardware defined as a big endian number? If so, we can tag it as a big endian number. Is something coming out of your hardware tagged as, like, by definition, a little endian number, we can tag it as a little endian number, and spars can help us keep track of what's big endian, what's little endian, what's CPU endian, and hopefully stop us from trampling over ourselves. Um, spars can keep track of the address space of pointers. So is this pointer that you're looking at a pointer, like does the memory address represent some memory in I.O. space? Does it represent some memory in user space? Does it represent some memory in kernel space? And can we, like, not try and dereference things in user space, for example. Um, spars will help you with types that you shouldn't just blindly use as integers. So, um, for example, time needs special treatment, and spars helps you do that. And, of course, there's more. Um, so what we're going to look at now is actually some real output from spars and some slightly truncated kernel code that causes the warnings. And Sparse warnings are not necessarily easy to parse, so we're going to talk about what sparse says and what sparse actually means when it's saying that. Here's, here's an example of stuff you can do with type annotations. So here we've got, we've defined an unsigned int called instr, and we're asking the kernel to uh, convert CPU to little endian 32-bit instr. Um, if 
We run spars on that, we get this glorious warning. Uh, warning, incorrect type and assignment, different base types, expected, unsigned in, blah, 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 got restricted, LE32. So what this is saying is, we're trying to have it both ways. We've both told the, we've told the compiler, we've told spars rather, that instro is an unsigned int. And if we don't tell it what endianness it is, it assumes it's CPU endianness. And then here, we've said, take this thing which we've said is CPU endianness, convert it to little endian, and then assign it back to our variable that's CPU endianness. So we, we're trying to have it both ways here. Either insta is CPU endian or it's 32-bit little endian. Um, it can't really, semantically, that name shouldn't be used for both. And that's what Spars is complaining about. It's saying on one side, we've got an unsigned int which is unsigned and assigned and called insta, uh, and on the other side we've got something which is an under under little endian 32, which is a 32-bit little endian type. So, and this code I extracted from the kernel and I believe works, but it's semantically confusing and that's what Spars is flagging for us. Another example here is, in this case, address spaces. So here we've got uh, under under user, so that is used to tag a user pointer. And what we've done here is we're calling probe kernel address on unsigned int under under user pointer PC, which is a program counter. And Spars um, flags this with this incredibly helpful message. Um, warning, incorrect type in argument two, different address space. When firstly, this is argument one, but there's a macro here that flips them around and Spars can't see through those macros, so it tells you that it's argument two, such as life in C. Um, expected void const pointer source, got unsigned int, no dereference, address space number one, pointer. Um, Spars is magic. Uh, address space number one is the thing that under under user translates to in internal Spars magic. And this is one of the things where I'm telling you this because it's not obvious and I'm hoping that we can make this a bit clearer by talking through it. So under under user tra translates to um, address space number one. That's also tagged as something you shouldn't dereference. And this is complaining that probe kernel address is expecting a void const pointer, so a pointer in kernel space, and you've given it a pointer in user space. And semantically, like, that makes sense. We've asked to probe a kernel address, and we've passed a user pointer. Like, something is not right here. Um, obviously, this code works because it doesn't really, like, that under under user doesn't change anything. It flags to us that this is a user pointer. But again, there's some confusion here in the heads of where this was written. Yes? Actually, it doesn't always work. Um, <laughs> it, it, it works on, actually, it doesn't. Actually, it doesn't always work. Um, it, it works on some architectures. Um, uh, for example, on, on PA RISC, uh, there are two 32-bit PA RISC, there are two four gigabyte address spaces, <laughs> one that's in use for the kernel addresses and one that's in use for user space addresses. Um, that's not the only architecture, but it's the one I happen to work on, so I right. that's, that's true. Um, but I, I think uh, x86 at one point had uh, a four gig, four gig split option that you could <laughs> compile in. Um, fortunately, we all moved to 64-bit and, and can ignore that horrific time. But anyway, uh, the theoretically, uh, we, we, we might come up with some other architectures in the future that also uh, don't yes. use the same thing. Yeah. So, in this case, by what I say, what I mean by saying it works is it comes from Linux PPC code, which I happen to believe works. Um, <laughs> this is not guaranteed to work in the general case, um, which is why we have the warnings, exactly. Thank you. Um, here's another one which is a little bit less clear. Here we've got a something that we've flagged as a user pointer, it's a signal frame of some sort, and here we are printing along with a bunch of other things, we're casting that pointer to a long and printing it, and we get a warning that our cast has gotten rid of the address space because that address space attaches to a pointer type, not to a number type. Um, this is one of those things where we sort of, uh, should we be printing pointers to user space? I'm not entirely confident that we should do. Uh, but this is another example of things Spars picks up. Uh, but wait, there's more. Uh, <laughs> Spars will warn you if you're doing things like uh, casting implicit cast to a no cast type, which means that there's a type, in this case, it's a time-related type 
that's been flagged as something that we shouldn't have implicit casts to because we want to use explicit time conversion functions because time is hard. Um, there are pointers that we flag as things that we shouldn't be dereferencing. So we saw an example of a user pointer was flagged as no dereference. And here we've got some IO space pointers that are flagged as no dereference. And we've also got restricted types. So again, they're types where you want to be more careful about how things are uh, going in and out of them and not treating everything blindly as integers. And, um, so I want to sort of make the argument that um, all of these are things that we do, at least in theory, care about. Uh, like, all of these examples come from Linux PowerPC code, so as far as I'm aware, nothing is actually broken, but things could easily be broken, and especially if your architecture decides to swap from big endian to by endian, um, these, you start to care about these things. So, this sort of ties into the next point, which is how, how are we using sparse in practice? Uh, in theory, all of these things are really helpful. The semantic parsing helps us keep things clear in code and in our heads. Uh, for example, we, instead of trying to keep track in our heads of when something, when a variable represents a little endian quantity and when a variable represents a CPU endian quantity and when a variable represents a big endian quantity, we just tag them and we keep separate variables for separate things. Um, instead of treating pointers as unsigned longs and doing magic to them, uh, we keep track of what's a user pointer and what's a kernel pointer and what's an I.O. pointer. I think I want to argue that this is good, but in practice, um, this is the number of sparse warnings on two basic PPC um, def configs, and there are about 3,000 of them. And it's tracked at about the same and actually rising over uh, much of the course of the year. As a, yeah, this runs from the end of December last year to December this year. So, in practice, there's just too much stuff. Um, we can't keep track of it all. So, sparse basically sits unused in our toolkit of kernel tools. Um, can we improve this situation? Uh, <laughs> I want to argue there are two things that we need to be doing. Uh, there's some stuff we need to do in the long run, and there's some, fortunately, good news for the short run. Uh, in the long term, we need to fix the warnings, right? Like, <laughs> these are things that are not necessarily bugs, but they're things that can easily turn into bugs if someone modifies the code and doesn't have precisely the same mental model of everything that was going on that the original author did. Or if the original author comes back and forgets something and introduces a new bug. I don't really care about at that at the moment. Um, and this is what I have been doing over the last year. I've tried to get patches into each merge window for Linux PowerPC, and you can see that there is just this nice, gentle decline in sparse warnings. Um, I haven't been quite as effective as I would like, um, and there are still far too many. So we started out at, this is deduplicated, so you, because of macros, you get about four or five warnings for every time you do something wrong. Um, it started out at 550 and we're down to, what is that, about 400. Um, and this was all going very well uh, until this happened. Uh, <laughs> this is what happens if you extend the graph to the present day. Um, what? Um, this also affected our def configs, so we've jumped from 3,000 warnings to about 9,000 warnings. Um, what? Uh, this is what happened. Um, uh, we enabled Endian checks, and Michael decided that there are only about 10% on the builds that he was looking at. Um, this does not match my experience, so I don't know. I don't want to say that PowerPC has more warnings, but I think PowerPC includes a lot of non-Endian safe code in the driver section. So, anyway. Um, and, you know, unsurprisingly, the sorts of things that go wrong are precisely the sorts of things you would expect to see. We get lots more warnings about all sorts of different, you know, cast restricted big endian 16, incorrect types where one is big endian 16, uh, cast restricted big endian 64, something about big endian 32. So, the, the sorts of things you would expect when we're doing more um, rigorous endian checking is indeed the sorts of things that happen. Um, so, I suppose I have a lot more to do next year. Yay! 
Um, so in the long term, we need to fix the warnings. And obviously this is not a problem that is specific to PowerPC. If there are 2,000 in whatever architecture Michael was building for, which was probably x86, that means all of you x86 developers and other architecture developers have stuff to do as well. But look, in the short term, we'd like to make this useful now rather than like in the 10, five, 10 year future when we actually squash the sparse warnings. And the big problem that we've got is that there's so many of them and it's really hard to see what changes because there are just so darn many. Um, how would you try? Well, there are a few things you can do. Um, you can just count them. So I have a P-series DEF config and we can just grep for arch power PC in P-series and count it, and there are 1,020. So, you know, that's great. I can count the next one along, and there are 1,020. So I guess we haven't got worse, but we don't know whether we've added some and removed some and we've masked actual things getting worse. Uh, we could try diffing them. That works about as well as you might imagine. Uh, there are 15,000 changed lines. Let me make that a bit bigger. Um, yeah, 15,000 lines change between those two. Um, part of the problem is that because we're building with dash J, uh, everything gets out of order. Um, we can sort these. So I've sorted both. Um, if we do a diff with the two sorted logs, there's only 692 changes. Uh, <laughs> because we don't take into account changing line numbers. So if you, if you have a sparse warning midway down your file, you add a hunk in the top of your file, the line numbers are all gonna change, but the warnings aren't. Uh, what do you do? <laughs> there, there are no, it would appear there are no existing tools that do this. So much as I don't like writing more tools, uh, we could write a tool to do this. Um, we, could, we could try and script set or cut together um, so the, the, the question was, could we use set or cut? Yes, yeah, sort of. Um, but what I have done is written 300 or so lines of Python, um, which does those sorts of things um, and provides us with a nice, smart, sparse diff. So let's see what happens if we run that on those two log files, and it's now in the upper directory. There are six lines now that have changed, which is a nice manageable number. We can actually read those if we could fit them on the screen. And uh, we've seen we've lost some warnings in kernel C group. Um, we've added another warning in kernel C group, which actually looks like the same warning. We've just changed the entire file. Um, we've had some changes in kernel config data.h and xx means I've tried to do line insensitive matching. And it turns out that that's mostly the same. We're just trying to concatenate a massive long string, which Spars doesn't like. Um, and we've actually added some warnings as well. So, if we had just done a count, we would have said, oh, things are mostly the same, but here we can get a little bit higher fidelity information, and instead of writing, instead of you all having to go and write scripts that use set and cut and uh, awk, uh, you can use mine instead. So this is hopefully helpful to people. I would encourage you all to play with it and file bugs uh, and let me know how it goes. Uh, it is currently on GitHub. Um, Ta-da. Um, so, where to from here? Um, please fix sparse warnings. Uh, <laughs> once we've reached them, we can try and not add them as contributors, as maintainers, you can ask people to please not add more sparse warnings. And if you enjoy trolling mailing lists, you can run spars on people and see if they add more warnings. Because uh, everyone loves getting flamed for that. Uh, <laughs> Just before I finish up, I wanted, I flagged at the beginning, I wanted to talk about starting kernel development. So a lot of people try and start their kernel development by fixing like spelling mistakes and comments and things. And that's a way to do it, but I think this is a bit more fun. And so assuming you know a little bit of C and you're willing to read up on how sparse works, here's how you can use that as a gateway to kernel development. So this is my suggested model, this is not gospel. 
Uh, I suggest you pick a file with sparse warnings and then you run git log on it to find out how you actually get changes into that file because it's different for different parts of the kernel. Once you've found the patches that go in, you can Google them and see what mailing list they went to. Um, and then you'll know where to, send your uh, where to send your patch and you can see who's likely to respond and you can sort of get a feel for the process of, for the community for that little group. Um, find a type of sparse warning and fix all of the warnings of that type in the file. Don't just fix like one random warning because that tends to irritate maintainers. And uh, please do test your stuff, like compile it. If you're running on PowerPC, for example, we have a lot of DEF configs. Check them all, please. Um, the maintainer should check all of the weird, quirky configs, but try and check the main ones. Um, and do consult the documentation. So there's a documentation on submitting patches in the kernel. Um, please read it. And expect some, like, don't expect things to go in the first time. Like, that's an unfortunate fact of life in the kernel community. Um, you will get bike shedded a bit. And it's not a criticism of you personally, it's just the way life works. Um, and if you've got any questions on that, feel free to talk to me um, either in the question time or afterwards. So, we've looked at SPARS. SPARS is a semantic parser for C. Uh, SPARS detects nice, simple static analysis things and also with type annotations can detect quite powerful things like um, the space, address space of pointers, the endianness of variables, things like that. Unfortunately, it doesn't get as much use as it should because there's a massive overload of SPARS warnings we should fix this by reducing the number of sparse warnings, uh, but in the short term, we can use some tooling to get a better idea of what's changing in amongst all the noise. Um, and that is all. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? With that, um change in Endian check that yes. uh, caused a large jump. Would you expect to see the same in Z Linux? Uh, a large jump in... You know, yeah, uh, does, does Z Linux do by Endian stuff? Like, or has Z Linux always historically been one Endian? I'm not a Probably Z Linux. one Endian, yeah. yeah. I would expect a jump because it will still detect when you're not being as careful with conversions as you should be but I would not expect as big a jump as a code base that supports two Indians. But you should try and find out. <laughs> okay, well that seems to be all, thank you. <laughs>